Welcome to this edition of Criminal Mischief, the Art and Science of Crime Fiction. I'm D.P. Lyle. Today I want to talk about introducing characters. How do you get characters into your story? Remember, first impressions count. Um, it happens in life, it happens in fiction. Your first impression of a character may stick with you throughout the story, so it should be a good one. Uh, not necessarily good in good versus evil, but it should be a good description or a good um, construction of the character so that the reader is drawn to that character in some way or repelled from that character, but they have some emotional attachment to the character. Now, characters can be introduced a lot of ways. Uh, through dialogue, through action, through a description from someone else, uh, through what they're saying, what they're thinking, what they're doing. Um, it could just be an out-and-out out out description, though that's not always the best way, but it does work sometimes. So let's look at some examples of how characters are introduced, and some of these are very iconic characters that you know and you've read about. Let's start with this one from Writing the Rap by Elmore Leonard. This Akala police picked up Dale Crow Jr. for weaving, two o'clock in the morning, crossing the center line and having a busted tail light. Then while Dale was blowing a .19, they put his name and date of birth into the national crime computer and learned he was a fugitive felon, wanted on a three-year-old charge for unlawful flight to avoid incarceration. A few days later, Raylan Givens, with the Marshal Service, came up from Palm Beach County to take Dale back to the Oca and the Ocala police wondered about Raylan. How come he was a federal officer and Dale Crow Jr. was wanted on a state charge? He told them he was with FAST, the Fugitive Apprehension Strike Team, assigned to the Sheriff's Office in West Palm. And that was pretty much all this marshal said. They wondered, too, since he was alone, how he'd be able to drive and keep an eye on his prisoner. Dale Crow Jr. had been convicted of a third-degree, five-year felony battery of a police officer and was looking at additional time on the fugitive warrant. Dale Jr. might feel he had nothing to lose on this trip, so he was a rangy kid with the build of a college athlete bigger than this marshal in his blue suit and cowboy boots, the marshal calm, though, not appearing to be the least apprehensive. He said the West Palm Strike Force team were short-handed at the moment, the reason he was alone, but believed he would manage. <coughs> now, there's not a word of dialogue. There's a little bit of description. But you really learn about three different characters or groups of characters right here. First of all, Raylan Givens. So he wears, a, he wears cowboy boots and a blue suit. And he's a U.S. Marshal. And he's assigned to a task force. And he's been sent up there to drag this guy back for whatever reason. And he doesn't seem to be concerned. He seems very laid back, very confident, very good at his job. And you just get the feeling that this isn't going to go well. But you learn a lot about Raylan Givens, and this is an iconic character. If you watch the TV series uh, Justified, it was all about Raylan Givens. That was an Elmore Leonard creation. He was executive producer there. You also learn about Del Crow Jr., kind of a little bit about what he looks like, but mainly what kind of person he is. He's dangerous. He's got nothing to lose. He's desperate. So you can already see the conflict that's going to come down the road. You also get a taste of the Ocala Police Department. You can see these guys, they're kind of curious. They're looking, what's going on here? You know, this guy's a bad guy, and you you don't seem overly concerned. So you kind of get a feeling for the tension and the little rumbling electricity running through the department. So Elmore Leonard, in two paragraphs, has brought us into a story that we know something's going to happen. We already feel the tension, and we have already identified with Raylan Givens. We like him. He's a U.S. Marshal. He wears cowboy boots. And he's pretty laid back and laconic about the whole thing. So he's kind of a character you say, yeah, you know, I've known somebody like that. Let's look at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and this is in first person. So we learn about this person from their own thoughts. There's no dialogue. There's no real action here. Uh, this is from The Long Goodbye by Raymond Chandler. And this is the opening. When I got home, I mixed a stiff one 
and stood by the open window in the living room and sipped it and listened to the groundswell of traffic on Laurel Canyon Boulevard and looked at the glare of the big angry city hanging over the shoulder of the hills through which the boulevard had been cut. Far off the banshee wail of police or fire sirens rose and fell, never for very long completely silent. Twenty-four hours a day somebody is running, somebody else is trying to catch him. Out there in the night of a thousand crimes people are dying, being maimed, cut by flying glass, crushed against steering wheels or under heavy tires. People are being beaten, robbed, strangled, raped, and murdered. People were hungry, sick, bored, desperate with loneliness or remorse or fear or angry, cruel, fever is shaken by sobs. A city no worse than others, a city rich and vigorous and full of pride, a city lost and beaten and full of emptiness. It all depends on where you sit and what your own private score is. I didn't have one. I didn't care. I finished the drink and went to bed. <coughs> wow. Well, Philip Marlowe, <coughs> we know, we later learn he's a private eye and he is cynical at the very best. But what do we learn about this guy? We learn where he lives. We learn his knowledge. We get a, a feeling that this guy has been in law enforcement because he understands what's going on out there in the great city of Los Angeles. We know we're in Los Angeles because Laurel Canyon Boulevard. Uh, we know that he's overlooking from the hills of the angry city. It's a city no worse than others. And it's full of pride, but it's also full of emptiness. We get all that feeling and it's all filtered through Marlowe's point of view. We don't even have a name for him. We don't have a description for him yet, but we already know who he is. And this is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant introduction of a character. The reader will say, wow, what made this guy this way? And what is this world he lives in? And what is he going to do about it? What's going to happen to him next? I defy you to, to, to stop reading that and you will fall in love with Marlowe as obviously tens of millions of people have. Also another one here also from Raymond Chandler and it's trouble is my business and this is Marlowe when he meets Harriet Huntress and this is in chapter three of this book. She wore a street dress of pale green wool and a small cockeyed hat that hung over her left ear like a butterfly. Her eyes were wide set and there was thinking room between them. Their color was lapis lazuli blue, and the color of her hair was dusky red, like a fire under control, but still dangerous. She was too tall to be cute. She wore plenty of makeup in the right places, and the cigarette she was poking at me with a built-on mouthpiece about three inches long. She didn't look hard, but she looked as if she had heard all the answers and remembered the ones she thought she might be able to use sometime. Wow. Wow. Do you see this woman? Do you know this woman? She's dressed nicely. She's got the cigarette holder. She obviously is of means. She's got these blue eyes and this dusky red hair that's like a fire under control, but still dangerous. So you get a feeling that there's more to her than what you see on the surface. The way she handles the cigarette, the way she pokes it at him, and that the brilliant part, she didn't look hard but she looked as if she had heard all the answers and remembered the ones she thought she might be able to use sometime. Boy, that says so much about this character. It's, um, it's amazing. And he does this in one paragraph. It's so clean. It's so simple. And you could write three pages of describing this woman and telling her backstory. And you would not be able to get a clearer picture of who this person is and that there is danger, that there is tension, and that, that something's going to happen, and you worry for Marlowe. Now, everybody knows James Lee Burke. Uh, he's an Edgar master. He's won the Edgar for Best Novel a couple of times. I think he writes the best crime fiction in the world. It's literary. It's poetic. It's gritty. It's dirty. It's got great characters. It's got great stories. It's got great conflict. It's just got great everything. And we're all familiar with the Dave Robichaux character. Uh, I think he's written 20-something books with Dave, and they've all been just marvelous. But it all started with a book called Neon Rain. 
And we learn about Dave and we learn about his partner, Cleet Purcell, or Cletus is his real name, but everybody calls him Cleet. Without a doubt, one of the great sidekicks and one of the great characters in all of crime fiction. Cleet Purcell is a bull in the china cabinet. He is a wonderful character. He is out of control most of the time. And, and he and Dave have this relationship that goes way, way, way back. Well, it goes back to Neon Rain, and this is how the book starts. My partner was Cletus Purcell. Our desk faced each other in a small room in an old converted fire station on Basin Street. Before the building was a fire station, it had been a cotton warehouse. And before the Civil War, slaves had been kept in the basement and led upstairs into a dirt ring that served both as an auction arena and a cockfighting pit. Cletus's face looked like it was made from boiled pigskin, except there was stitch scars across the bridge of his nose and through one eyebrow where he had been bashed by a pipe when he was a kid in the Irish Channel. He was a big man with sandy hair and intelligent green eyes, and he fought to keep his weight down, unsuccessfully, by pumping iron four nights a week in his garage. Do you know a character named Wesley Potts, I asked? Christ, yes, I went to school with him and his brother. What a family. It was like having bread mold as your next-door neighbor. Johnny Messina said this guy's talking about pulling my plug. Sounds like bullshit to me. Potts is a gutless lowlife. He runs a dirty movie house on Bourbon. I'll introduce you to him this afternoon. You'll really enjoy this guy. Wow. Do you get a character you, you get a character sketch here, particularly of Cleet Purcell? It's interesting that it's a Dave Robicho novel and that we're in Dave's point of view. This is in first person. And yet the character we learn about first in this series is Cletus Purcell. Can you picture him? Big guy, overweight, muscle bound, scar on his face, sandy hair, green eyes, intelligent green eyes, because Cleet's not stupid. He's just crazy as you learn, as you read through this series. But right here, he did, James Lee Burke did use some physical description, but he also peppered in his backstory, where the scar came from, how he thinks about the world. I mean, it's like living next door to bread mold, you know, and that, you know, he's a gutless low life. You'll really enjoy this guy. Funny stuff, funny stuff, and yet gritty. And uh, that's how you introduce a character. That's how you create an image in the reader's mind about this character. Let's look at another one, also from an Edgar winner. In fact, a three-time Edgar winner. Two for best novel, one for a short story, California Girl by T. Jefferson Parker. And if you haven't read Jeff Parker, you should. And if you haven't read California Girl, it was one of the books he won the Edgar for, you should. It is fantastic. And this is how it starts. Here and now. I drove past the old sun-blessed packing house today. Nothing left of it. Not one stick. Now there's a bedroom store, pet emporium, and a supermarket. Big and new. Moms and dads and kids everywhere. Pretty people, especially the moms. Young, with time to dream, wake up, and dream again. I still have a piece of the flooring I tore off the sun-blessed packing house back in 68, when I was young, when I thought that what had happened there should never happen anywhere, when I thought it was up to me to put things right. I'm made of that place, the old wood and the rusted conveyors and the pigeons in the eaves and the sunlight slamming through the cracks, of Janelle Vaughn, of everything that went down there in October 1968, even made of the wind that blew that month dry and hot off the desert, huffing across Orange County to the sea. I have a piece of the picket fence from the grassy knoll at Dealey Plaza, too, and a piece of rock that came not far from where Mercury One lifted off, and one of Charlie Manson's guitar picks. But those are different stories. Wow. What do we learn about this character? He's got a past. He's got a history. He's got sadness. He's got knowledge. He's got issues. He was naive at one time, and now he's more cynical. He thought he could save the world, but it didn't work out that way. And who is Janelle Vaughn? And what went down in October of 1968? And how did that affect this guy? How did it change him? How did it take him from a 
wide-eyed, naive person into someone who is more cynical. And what's going to happen next? What's he involved in now? All of these and a couple of paragraphs, brilliant writing, very poetic writing, and great character introduction. Megan Abbott, one of my favorite writers. Megan writes down in dirty fiction, and if you haven't read her, you should. But she, her award-winning uh, first book was called Queen Pen, and it's still, to me, one of the best books I've ever read. And if you haven't read it, go pick up a copy now and read it. And this is how it begins. I want the legs. That was the first thing that came into my head. The legs were the legs of a 20-year-old Vegas showgirl, 100 feet long and with just enough curve and give and promise. Sure, there was no hiding the slightly worn hands or the beginning tugs of the skin framing the bones in her face, but the legs, they lasted, I tell you. They endured. Two decades her junior, my skinny matchsticks were no competition. In the casino, she could pass for 30. The low lighting, her glossy auburn hair, legs swinging, tapping the bottom rim of a tall, better stools. At the track, though, she looked her age, even swathed in oversized sunglasses, a wide-brimmed hat, bright gloves. She couldn't outflank the merciless sunshine, the glare off the grandstand. Not that it mattered. She was legend. I was never sure what she saw in me. You looked like a, you knew a thing or two, she told me later but you were ready to learn a lot more. Wow. Do you believe that? Do you see both of these characters? You see the woman who's obviously the queen pin of the story. Uh, you see that she's older, but she's got the chops. She's definitely got the legs. She's powerful, obviously. And here's this young girl who has entered this story, and do we worry about her? Absolutely, we worry about her. We worry that she is getting involved in something over her head. We don't know about her yet, but we know who she is because these impressions of this older woman, this powerful woman, this queen pin, we see it through her point of view. We see envy. We see desire. We see need. We see want. But we also get a little undercurrent that She's very naive. I never saw what she saw in me. And she said, you looked like you knew a thing or two, but were ready to learn a lot more. Wild. Is that a loaded statement? Well, Megan's a great writer, and, and there it shows. Here's another one for you. Hank was drunk, and he slugged me. It wasn't the first time, and I picked up the radio and caught him across the forehead with it. It was one of those big boom boxes with the cassette player and recorder, but I never figured it would kill him. We were sitting in front of the fan, listening to country music and sipping Jack Daniels, calling each other toots. Like we both enjoyed. And all of a sudden, the whole world changed. My old man was dead. It didn't feel like I had anything to do with it. I didn't make that choice. I spent a few days in jail till the law decided I wasn't to blame. It was Hank's long record got me out. He was known to the cops. Afterwards, I went on drinking and missing that son of a bitch like hell. There were several months. I don't know what I was doing. He had a terrible mean streak, but we were good together, especially when we got our clothes off. At some point, I woke up from a blackout and was in the hospital. I had vague memories of some asshole buying me drinks and him on top of me in a musty-smelling bar. Correction, car. There were flashes of fist and the sound of it against my jaw, but I wasn't sure whose fist it was. I could have been mixing it up with another time. The nurse told me I looked like I've been kicked, beat up so bad I was lucky to be alive. I don't know why I believed her about being lucky. But after they patched me up and dried me out for a while, I was ready to give it a go, ready to try to make myself a life for the first, for the very first time. It was a big mistake. Wow. This is from Miami Purity by Vicki Hendricks. And if you haven't read Vicki, you need to read Vicki. She writes down and dirty, obviously. So what do we know about this character? Well, she obviously runs in some very r rough circles. She has trouble with alcohol, probably drugs. She doesn't choose men well. 
Uh, she obviously gets confused a lot again, alcohol. Uh, and you wonder if, um, if anything bad's going to happen to her now, of course, something bad's going to happen because she was going to try to make herself a life. And it ends with, it was a big mistake. We know something bad is coming. We know it for a fact. So this character is dark, but witty, uh, and charming in a certain way. And she's also a survivor. And so we're going to follow her. We're going to want to know what happens to her. We're going to want to know more about her. We're going to believe in her. We are going to, we are going to, we're going to take her to where we need to take her. And she's going to lead us into, in down the rabbit hole. Um, great character development, great everything. Now I want to read one from you from Run to Ground, my third Dub Walker book. I can still smell him. Martha Foster inhaled deeply and closed her eyes. Tim stood just inside the doorway and looked down at his wife. She sat on the edge of their son's bed, eyes moist, chin trembling, as were the fingers that clutched the navy blue Tommy Hilfiger sweatshirt, sweatshirt to her chest. It had been Stephen's favorite. He had slept in it every night the first month until Martha finally pried it away long enough to run it through the wash. Behind her, a dozen photos of Stephen lay scattered across the blue comforter. A proud Stephen in his first baseball uniform. A seven-year-old Stephen grinning, upper left front tooth missing, soft freckles over his nose, buzz-cut hair, a blue swimming ribbon dangling around his neck. A playful Stephen, sitting next to Martha in the backyard picnic table, face screwed into a goofy expression, smoke from the Weber barbecue rising, uh, rising behind them. Tim remembered the day he snapped the picture, Labor Day weekend, just six months before that day. He squeezed back his own tears and swallowed hard. Martha shifted her weight and twisted toward the photos. She laid the sweatshirt aside and reached out, lightly touching an image of Stephen's face. The trembling of her delicate fingers increased. She said nothing for a moment, and then, I'm taking these. Tim walked to where she sat and pulled her to him, her cheek nestling against his chest, her tears soaking through his T-shirt. He kissed the top of her head. He's gone, Martha said. Everything's gone, or will be. Wow. Do you like these characters? Do you like this couple? What's going on? What happened to Stephen? What are they planning? What do you mean everything's gone or will be? Who are they? What's going to happen next? Well, I hope you like that one <laughs> since that was from my book. I think you've seen from all these examples, there's a lots of ways to introduce characters, but you mainly do it by getting into the story and by getting something happening, uh, getting into somebody's head, getting into some dialogue, getting into some action. And we've seen a little bit in all of that. Now, in the show notes that I always post, they'll be on my website and my blog. I've offered you other examples, too, and there's a gazillion of them out there. Every time you read, look at those paragraphs that introduce a character. And what you will find is there's a lots of ways of doing it. Learn from those. And when you have to introduce your characters, use those techniques to make your characters memorable and drag them into the story. And more importantly, drag the reader into the story. Well, I hope this has been useful and you've learned some good stuff from this. So this has been this edition of Criminal Mischief. Until next time, this is D.P. Lyle. I'll see you then.